Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see you today. Uh, welcome from Jews United for Democracy and Justice and from Community Advocates, Inc. And for our leadership team, former Congressman Mel Levine, Xavier Oslovsky, Rabbi Ken Chazen, Caroline Kelly, David Lehrer, and myself. Next week, we'll, we will be joined by journalism's power couple, Peter Baker of the New York Times and Susan Glasser of the New Yorker, both of whom were Russia-based foreign correspondents who chronicled the rise of Vladimir Putin. They will be in conversation with Madeleine Brand on the topic of Russo-Ukraine war, where are we and how will it end? And I'm sure they will also be discussing relevant domestic topics. In two weeks, we'll be joined by the always interesting New York Times op-ed columnist, David Brooks, who will give us his insights on the state of authoritarianism, both at home and abroad. I will be out of internet reach for the next three programs, but I will be, look forward to, I will be looking forward to catching up both on the programs and with you in mid-July. We have been very busy planning our August and September America at a Crossroads programs and are happy to report that we will not disappoint you with what's coming up. And to hear about just a few of them, here's my partner, the great David Lehrer. Thank you, Janice, we will miss you. Sometimes the programming gods are with you, sometimes not. We invite people weeks in advance and never know where the headlines will end up on the air date. Tonight topic, tonight's topic couldn't be more on the mark. Between the Georgia primary last night, the January 6th select committee hearings yesterday, and the omnipresent talk of voter suppression laws and acts, tonight we have been blessed in our guests and moderator. The gods were with us. Following on the two programs Janice mentioned, We'll have Bill Browder on July 13th. Browder is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Freezing Order. He was at one time Russia's largest foreign investor and became the subject of Vladimir Putin's ire, an anger that was accompanied with murder, money laundering, and more, all of which he will discuss. The following week, we will host the prominent social psychologist, Jonathan Haidt, who is quoted at length in today's New York Times about the persistence and prevalence of conspiracy, conspiracy theories. You'll receive a link to that up after the program in Janice's email. And we have several other top tier speakers scheduled over the next two months. They all will appear on the screen at the end of the program and you will also receive emails about them. Our moderator tonight, Pat Morrison, is one of our most frequent hosts, a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the Los Angeles Times, whose breadth of knowledge is truly impressive. Just today, I heard her on NPR's KPCC discussing the heyday of race car tracks in Southern California. We were once the nation's center of the sports, where they were located, the audience who attended, and why they disappeared. Who knew? With Pat and our guests, it's sure, sure to be a fascinating evening this tonight. Pat? David, thank you so much. Thanks to Janice, too. And thank you to all of you who are watching and listening to this important program. Some of you may even be from Georgia, and we welcome Greg Bluestein for his first appearance here, and Rick Hassan back again. Rick Hassan's book, is cheap speech how disinformation there it is poisons poisons are politics and how to cure it and greg bluestein's book is right here flipped how georgia whoops i'm not showing it to you very well there we go how georgia um turned purple and broke the monopoly on republican power and as i said this is an important time for us to be discussing it because the Congress of this country is looking behind the curtain of our electoral politics, which seems to be composed in some parts of fantasy, delusion, and now even violence. The events of January 6, 2021, and the matters leading up to them, some of them unethical, some of them illegal, and some of them questionably constitutional. We have venom and division in this country that's unprecedented, perhaps since before the beginning of the Civil War. And it reminds me of Ben Franklin, one of his last services to this country was attending the Constitutional Convention. And as he left the Constitutional Convention that day, a woman came up to him and said, which is it, Dr. Franklin, a republic or a monarchy? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. We are now testing, to use the, Lincoln's fr the Lincoln phrase, whether or not we can keep our republic or not. And what are we doing in the throes of it? We're going to find out from our guests right now. So Rick, let me start with you. We've always had political information. We've always had disinformation. What's the difference now and what's the political risk of what you call cheap speech? Well, let me just say first, thanks uh, uh, to David and Janice and, and Zev and Mel for inviting me back uh, and great to be with you and, and with Greg. Uh, I do think that uh, our Republic is at risk in ways that it hasn't been 
uh, before. Uh, you know, you can look back at what happened in 2020, and we're hearing a lot about that in these January 6th hearings, and think, well, that was the low point. Uh, I unfortunately look at 2020 and think that was the rehearsal. And I worry about what it is that is coming next. Uh, in part, as I explain in my book, Cheap Speech, uh, the way that information spreads, the way that people receive information is very different than 20 or 30 years ago, makes it much easier for lies like the fact that the 2020 election was stolen to take hold. And those kind of lies have real political implications. Not again, not just for the past and not just as to whether or not people will be punished for the January 6th insurrection and the events trying to mess with, with um, the vote count on January 6th, uh, 2021, 20, uh, but also for the future when the people who are running elections uh, either believe or say they believe that the last election was stolen, uh, how can we count on them to administer the 2024 elections fairly and even if they would do so, is the kind of lack of faith in the election process that we see on the right going to spread to the left as someone like Doug Mastriano, the Republican nominee for governor of Pennsylvania, says that you know he wouldn't have certified Biden in 2020. Well, what's going to happen if it's Trump versus Biden too and Biden purportedly wins Pennsylvania in 2024? So We've got a really rough road ahead of us, and we need to think now about how to secure our democracy for the future. You get to some solutions in the book, and we'll get to them later. But what what is, as you laid it out in the book, the difference between disinformation and misinformation? And does that difference really matter when, when both of them seem to be pervasive? Well, uh, typically misinformation is defined as any kind of false information, and disinformation is deliberately spread. Uh, false information. And so disinformation is being distributed either for profit uh, or for political reasons or for both. And I'll, I'll just give one example here of both, which is uh, that uh, you may remember in the immediate aftermath of the 2020 election, Donald Trump started fundraising for what he said was his legal expenses associated with, with running elections. Uh, we now heard from reporting from the January 6th committee that about $250 million was raised, and most of it was not put towards trying to fight the election, but instead was done to create a kind of political slush fund uh, for Donald Trump through what's called the Leadership Pact. Uh, it's really hard to know where the politics ends and the grift begins. And so I think that, you know, as we look forward to um, what politics is going to look like in 2024, and even as we look to the midterm elections, there's a renewed talk of foreign countries, including Russia, trying to interfere with American elections by deliberately spreading disinformation. But I think that the greatest threats to American democracy are not external, uh, they are internal. Uh, we face uh, a, uh, a rising acceptance of authoritarianism in this country in a way that I never expected we would see. And a big part of that is because not only does social media and the information environment allow lies to spread, but it also allows for there to be political organizing. We wouldn't have had the events of January 6th if we had the polarized politics of today, but the technology of the 1950s. And so while there's many advantages of being able to organize and share information and not be subject to whatever it is that the Los Angeles Times or Channel 4 decides to put in front of us, uh, there are risks as well. And we have to think about how to fix our rules and our democracy so that um, valuable information, information that voters can rely upon to make sound choices uh, can be put in place. And also I should say, um, to the extent that this is a supply problem rather than a demand problem, that people want the false information and you're talking about changing people's preferences, that's a much harder um, type of problem to solve. Greg, I'd like you to lay some groundwork for everyone about the nature of politics in Georgia, why Georgia is such an important bellwether state and such a significant part of the country. And I can remember back to uh, uh, Newt Gingrich, who was the Speaker of the House representative from Georgia, was talking about family values during the Clinton administration's falls from moral grace at the same time that he served his wife with divorce papers in the hospital because he had a girlfriend. And 
and that, that Max Cleland, who was a senator, who was a Vietnam veteran, who I think had lost three of his four limbs in Vietnam, was, was being accused of, of being of disloyal and being unworthy uh, to serve the United States. So this predates the internet, but it seems like Georgia now has lightning in a bottle for so many of these elements coming together. Yeah, we really do. And, and thank you again for, for uh, hosting me. This is an honor to be here. Uh, Georgia is the premier battleground state in the entire nation. And, and it's, it's, it's strange for me to say that because not long ago, it felt like we were a sleepy backwater. We had great stories, great stories to tell. But in terms of competition, we were not the most closely divided state in the nation like we are right now. Uh, Democrats ruled Georgia with an iron fist for generations. It wasn't until 2002 when uh, a former Democrat named Sonny Perdue, who switched parties, became the first Republican governor since Reconstruction. And he ushered in a, a sweep of changes um, where uh, Republicans took control of the state legislature and then took control of every statewide office. But even but before then- can, can, can I interrupt you to tell people that the labels there are less important than the policies because the labels over a hundred some years may have switched uh, in terms of the policies and alignments of parties in Georgia. You're exactly right. I mean, a Democrat in Georgia would be indistinguishable from a Re Republican in Georgia these days. There, there is an occasional ex ex exception. There was um, Democratic governors who were progressive or moderate. Um, Jimmy Carter was a famed, you know, he, he, he's now known, of course, as a, as a liberal a former president, but he was, a, he was very moderate um, as a governor of Georgia. Um, but for the most part, Democrats were very conservative. Um, and, and had a coalition built on African-Americans in urban areas and rural white voters. It was very hard coalition to keep together because of such disparate factions and causes and, and issues that, that mobilized them. But um, tradition helped keep it together. Uh, polarizing issues helped keep it together. And just the weakness of the state Republican Party, which really, to a large degree, was either um, liberal whites or suburbanites. And it was Newt Gingrich, as you mentioned, who helped the uh, Republican Party gain a foothold in the, the Atlanta suburbs, the metro Atlanta suburbs, with his uh, revolution, with his, uh, uh, with his policies, his conservative sort of take no prisoners approach that ushered in a whole new uh, era of Republican leadership. Johnny Isaacson, the late senator, um, also from Newt Gingrich's old district, Tom Price. There's a number of Republican leaders, but even back then, Johnny Isaacson joked that you could fit every Republican in Georgia in a phone booth. And he wasn't all that far off. You'd go to Republican events in the, in the 90s and there'd be, you know, you would know every single person in the room. That started changing with the influx of, of newcomers in Georgia. And, and, and frankly, as, as the National Democratic Party veered from the state Democratic Party and Democrats realized either they could switch parties or run away from the national brand. And Sonny Perdue, that Republican, that, that former Democratic turned Republican governor, hastened that switch in the early 2000s. And then you just saw it like a sort of like a house of cards. I mean, the, a domino effect of Republicans taking every statewide office, of taking a uh, commanding lead in the state delegation right. and in the state legislature, and ushering in all sorts of new conservative policies. So now we have a new kind of Democrat in Georgia. Uh, Stacey Abrams is now a nationally famous name and a nationally famous figure. We not know that uh, Ossoff and Warnock famously won two Senate races they weren't expected to win and that changed the balance of power in the United States Senate. So convince us that what happened in 2018, 2020 isn't just the purple unicorn winning the lottery, that you think that this is something durable. Well, it could be the purple unicorn winning the lottery, but I'll say that Democrats in part won because they were authentic. You know, not so long ago, Democrats in Georgia ran as NRA Democrats. They ran away from, when President Obama came to town, they ran away from them. Um, they didn't embrace liberal or, or core liberal issues or progressive issues. Um, they, you know, they, they ran, a, they steered away from gay marriage. They steered away from talking about abortion rights. The issues that now are synonymous with Democrats in Georgia and elsewhere, they stayed away from. Um, as, early, as, as recently as 2014, the Democratic nominees for governor and U.S. Senate um, ran as NRA Democrats. They supported uh, expanding gun rights. And when Obama came to town, they made excuses to go to South Georgia to visit with farmers. And that changed dramatically with Stacey Abrams um, showing in 2018, the Democrats maybe can't win because she came 55,000 votes away from winning, but can get darn close if they embrace those issues. She talked about 
uh, legalizing marijuana. She talked about uh, gun restrictions, gun control. Um, she talked openly about you know, reparations and other issues that Democrats steered clear from. And then in 2020, um, she expanded on that. You know, she, she's widely credited as being the orchestrator, the engineer, the architect of the, uh, of the, of the epic Democratic wins in 2020. Now, were Democrats Trump. helped by Donald Trump? Sure, right? Tens of thousands of Republican voters stayed home um, or undervoted. They, they skipped the, the, uh, the top races because they were believers of Donald Trump's lies. But at the same oh. time, Democrats stayed on their message. They stayed on point. Um, they, didn't, they didn't get distracted by the Trump you know, rhetoric. They, and they, they, they catered to a core Democratic crowd. They built a coalition. It's going to be hard to rebuild oh. it, but they built a coalition. <laughs> but a groundwork is there. So, so Rick, what we were just hearing from Greg is that Democrats did not run from democratic policies. But one of the things that strikes me about what was going on in your book uh, was kind of a Gresham's law of bad money crowding out good. Here you have bad information crowding out good. But it sometimes doesn't seem like information at all that policies get lost in this, um, this artillery fire back and forth. Um, you, you've got people you know, on, on the right calling Democrats communists or pedophiles and that seems to be the idea of where debate begins and ends right now well you know one thing that's changed and um uh i think this is true in georgia and across the country is that uh, the more outrageous you are the more extreme you are and, and this is true whether you're a democrat or republican the easier you're going to have a time establishing an independent base of fundraising uh so you know if you're someone like a marjorie taylor green to take a, a georgia example um you know, in the old days, if, if you were someone like that, you have a really hard time getting the national party to be putting money behind your campaign because you'd be seen as too extreme and, you know, they'd want somebody who would be maybe more moderate and maybe more pro-business. But now uh, she can go right to social media. She can post an incendiary video. Uh, you know, she can have pictures of all of her family with guns and she'll be able to raise money. And as I said, this is, uh, you know, you can see someone like AOC on the left uh, you can even take to a California example, Katie Porter, they can establish their own base of support and they don't need the national parties anymore. And so it's not just that the news media no longer serve as the kind of intermediaries that they used to in terms of helping voters make sense of a very messy world, but also political parties mean a lot less. I mean, think about Donald Trump's positions on issues uh, like trade, uh, or immigration, they're so different than, say, the position that Mitt Romney or George W. Bush would have taken. Uh, the political parties have become less relevant, and that makes it harder for voters, too, uh, to the extent that a party is about personalities uh, rather than about a set of ideals. Uh, you end up with polarization, but not even on issues of, um, of substance but just on a, what, what uh, some political scientists call a kind of tribal polarization, that there's just this intense hatred of the other side. You know, the social scientists ask, you know, how, how would you feel if um, your child uh, wanted to marry someone of another race or another religion? Uh, well, now, if they say the child marries someone of the other party, that is the most objectionable uh, thing because people just have these tribal affiliations. And in this environment, uh, where we are so polarized, um, that can lead to all kinds of social ills, including violence, including you know political threats. Uh, we heard some of the testimony uh, of um, Brad Raffensperger, uh, the Secretary of State of Georgia, uh, Rusty Bowers, the Speaker of the House of Arizona, about how they were, you know, their phone numbers were put out there. Uh, their families who didn't some in some family members didn't even live with them be able to find them they were be, they were threatened uh, they were threatened with violence I mean so it's just a very hard environment in which to be a public official or a public figure um, and so you know all of this comes together and it's kind of like a toxic brew that is different even if you think back to the politics of 10 years ago I mean you think about Mitt Romney's campaign it's hard to believe that's the same party as the party of Donald Trump. It's not only radicalized, but as you point out in the book too, the discussion is atomized when there is no um, consensus news media that acts as kind of an outrigger or, a or as a corrective. Um, we can watch the coverage of the non-coverage by Fox News of the January 6th hearings and what does appear 
uh, is virtually non-existent. So people who are exclusively Fox News consumers have no frame of reference outside that. And we even see Donald Trump in the last day or two telling uh, Kevin McCarthy, who uh, was the who's the minority leader, well, you should have had some of, of your people on the panel, which McCarthy had refused to do, kind of acknowledging on Trump's part that people are paying attention, that people are listening. I think there was a, a representative today, a Republican representative, I'm looking for his data now, saying, you know, I probably wouldn't vote for Donald Trump again, knowing what I know about this. So, so the isolation that we have created for ourselves with the technology of social media in addition to cable has accelerated this, has it not? Oh, sure. And, you know, um, this problem extends beyond politics. I focus on politics, but, uh, you know, the uh, the stories uh, that we've read about what Facebook knows about what um, social media does to um, the, uh, the minds of teenagers and their self-esteem, you know, and, and what we know about the ability to use um, uh, social media uh, in cases of revenge porn. I mean, there's just all kinds of social ills. And, you know, part of the problem is that um, it, one of the key parts of our democracy is a commitment to free speech and to let private actors uh, say what they want to say. Uh, and yet we're hearing from the right and from the left that there needs to be some regulation of social media in order to control um, these social ills. It's, you know, it's easy to say that it's hard to come up with uh, cures that are not worse than the disease. And so, you know, if you say, all right, we're going to have a disinformation board, and it's going to decide what's true and false. Well, you know, we had a little controversy about that, maybe two months ago, when Homeland Security, the, the federal uh, agency announced there was a disinformation board, and everyone on the right was yelling, this was going to be government censorship, you know, um, even if what you're trying to do is the right thing, uh, just imagine that the president of the party that you hate the most is the one that gets to appoint people to this board or gets to decide these kinds of questions and you quickly see the kinds of issues uh, that we can run into. One of the most important things that I think social media companies can do on a positive note is make their data um, available to researchers. There's a push now for some legislation supported on both the right and left that would make Facebook and others have to disclose their data to researchers so that these social ills can be quantified. And so maybe we can come up with solutions or at least propose solutions and these companies can be pressured to do the right thing. I talk a lot in the book about the decision to deplatform Donald Trump. And we've heard, you know, since my book came out that Elon Musk might be purchasing Twitter, you know, that sale may or may not go through. And one of the things he's made it very clear is that he was going to restore Donald Trump to Twitter. Not clear Trump will come back because he's now has a competing social media company. Um, but those kinds of decisions made by private companies uh, have a great deal of um, uh, influence in our society. And I think it was a good thing on January 6th when Trump seemed to be fomenting the violence at the Capitol and, and didn't make a speech that really called off the dogs that he was taken off of those platforms. Uh, I'll, I'll just say it's the last thing that um, Facebook uh, deplatformed Trump indefinitely, but its own oversight board, which had appointed to kind of tell it what to do in these difficult cases, uh, told uh, Facebook, you have to come up with an end date uh, and some criteria for restoring Trump. And so on January 7th, 2023, Donald Trump is going to be restored to Facebook unless Facebook concludes that he remains a danger to American democracy. So there's a very tough decision coming to Facebook very soon. Greg, I wonder whether the people in Georgia have been particularly attentive to the hearings this week where the Secretary of State Raffsberger was testifying and where two women from Georgia who were volunteer poll workers talked about having their lives dismantled by being criticized by Donald Trump as engaging in, in, in criminal um, uh, ballot uh, engineering, in uh, vote stuffing, in vote destroying very movingly uh, hearing these two women who were just doing civic duty uh, and, and who found themselves in, in the words of one of them, you know, the president of the United States is calling her out and excoriating her for what she thought was a civic minded thing to do. So how is that playing in Georgia? And, and to what extent does this represent the kind of battle that Rick has been talking about? 
I'll tell you, it was it was front page news. It was it was um, the the lead uh, every story on on TV here in Georgia. But the worry, of course, is that Fox News and conservatives uh, weren't tuning in. Um, even Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, in an interview shortly after the hearing, said he wished that Fox News had had televised the hearing so that Republicans could hear for themselves uh, what the effect of the disinformation, misinformation, and disinformation from from Donald Trump and his allies, the effect it had on the personal toll it took. I mean, anyone who watched that, that testimony or, or, or saw the recaps, it's heartbreaking. Um, this was Shea Moss and her mother, Ruby Freeman, who were the subject of a, a twisted conspiracy, false conspiracy theory. They were somehow um, passing back and forth a USB drive full of tainted votes as they were counting ballots. They were, they were both Fulton County election staffers in our biggest county, Fulton County in the heart of Atlanta. Um, at a state farm arena, at a basketball arena that's used as a vote processing place in, in Fulton. Um, and as she, as she testified, it wasn't a USB drive as Rudy Giuliani and other um, Trump allies asserted. Um, she was passing a ginger mint to her mom, a ginger mint. And it, and it was because she passed that ginger mint that, that her life is essentially ruined. Um, uh, Shay Moss said she doesn't go out. She's gained 60 pounds. She hardly leaves the house. She doesn't feel comfortable using her own name. She feels safe nowhere now. Uh, you know, it, it was a reminder. And then her grandmother uh, had, had uh, pro-Trump forces burst into her house and try to make a citizen's arrest. Um, it's just a reminder to everyone in Georgia and beyond that these election fraud lies aren't just empty rhetoric. You know, they're not just campaign stump speeches that we in the media call out as lies. They have real effect on the people who they are targeting. They have real dangerous effect. And, you know, we were talking earlier about the bubbles that we're in. My, my, my most, I, I see those bubbles every single day in my job. Every time I open my email or look at my social media account, I have people saying, how, how do you not know about whatever conspiracy theory du jour is? Um, but my, my most sort of mo most impressionable moment was in shortly after the November election when there was a stop the steal rally. And I went to go swing by to, you know, maybe for a story just to see what was going on because at the time the stop the steal movement was just growing in Georgia. And it's in a very affluent park in the North Atlanta suburbs. So we're not talking about rural Georgia somewhere. We're talking about a park where I used to run cross country, where I actually broke my arm running cross country as a high schooler. And um, I showed up and expecting maybe 50 people there. There was closer to 2000 people there. They were, they were chanting, stop the steal, lock him up. Not about Democrats. They were stop chanting that about Brian Kemp. Lynn Wood, the disgraced lawyer was in the middle of it. So was a, a now former congressional candidate in Vernon Jones. But what stuck out to me was as, the, as these voters, as these, as these Georgians were leaving, I interviewed maybe a dozen or two dozen of them. And each person told me they were a dedicated, hardcore Trump supporter, a frequent Republican voter, and not a single one of them said that they were going to vote in the runoffs that just in a few weeks, that, that January 2021 runoffs, because they couldn't trust the vote. And I could have sit there the whole time and tell them why their conspiracy theories were wrong. This was debunked by the Secretary of State, who's a Republican. That was debunked by you know, the Attorney General, who's a Republican. But it didn't matter what I said. They were, they were listening to, I don't even want to call them media. They were just listening to this far right um, tangled social media sites that, where they were getting their information because as we said earlier, they can't trust the, the mainstream media for whatever reason. They cannot right. trust what we write. Uh, and we're, we're seeing, not just in Georgia, but in other states, and I'll ask Rick to expound on this too, but we're seeing a kind of Jim Crow 2.0 that if you can't win an election, you have to stop people from voting in elections. You have a very moving part in the book where one of a staffer came out and saw people waiting in line in Georgia for hours and hours and hours to vote. And the Republican rejoinder to that was not, well, they're certainly not going to add voting precincts and possibilities, but they made it a crime to give food and water to people waiting in line. So what are you seeing about voter repression and suppression, this kind of pushback that the gains of 2018 and the gains of 2020 are creating? Yeah, so we talk a lot about uh, the, the Republicans in Georgia who stood up to Trump, who stood up his election lies, like Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, like Governor Brian Kemp. But we also have to remember they were the chief promoters. They were the, some of the chief sponsors and advocates 
uh, for this, this new Georgia, it's called SB 202, Senate Bill 202, um, 98 page bill, if I remember correctly, 90 something page that overhauled, that rewrote Georgia's election laws. Um, it limited absentee voting drop boxes to early voting sites, required additional ID for absentee voting. Um, as you mentioned, it, it, it restricted outside groups from giving out food and water. And one of the biggest changes it had is it allowed, and we haven't really seen this take effect yet, um, but allowed state takeovers of county elections. That might be the provision that might have the longest lasting effect because it allows the Republican, co Re Republican controlled legislature. And, and, and to remind the audience, um, even, if, even if the governor's office flips, even if Stacey Abrams wins, and the, the state legislature will remain Republican well into this decade and, and beyond because um, during redistricting, Republicans redrew the, the lines of the political maps to make it very safe for Republicans to keep control of the legislature. So it gives the legislature power um, to do this. And we'd ask um, if leading Republican figures like Governor Kemp, um, like others, what's the purpose of this law? And, and, and almost exclusively, they came back and said, well, it's to restore integrity of the vote, confidence in the vote from Donald Trump's lies, from all those lies. Even one, one official, Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan, couldn't even say that. He just said, I don't, I don't really know. There's not, there's, not, there's not a reason right now. We're still trying to find that. So clearly, they passed this legislation because of the Trump-induced uh, lies. And here's something to remember. Some Republicans in Georgia wanted to go even further in restricting access to the ballot box this year. So even after passing that law, this year there was election year proposals that would eliminate all the ballot drop boxes. It would end no excuse absentee voting. So you'd have to have a doctor's note. You'd have to have a reason to vote by mail and, and then discard the state's recently purchased voting touchscreen machines. So there are still um, efforts underway in Georgia uh, to, to put new obstacles before the ballot box. Rick, on that same point, um, you've written a lot about voter suppression, voter exclusion efforts that have been successful in a lot of states. And now we also have uh, the election just in this past go round of a few secretary of state officials who will be in charge of certifying elections, counting votes, who are themselves um, election deniers. Just uh, recently, the New Mexico County Commissioner, who just been sentenced for his part in the January 6th insurrection, defied the certification of Biden as the winner of the presidential election in his county saying my vote to remain a no isn't based on any evidence it's not based on any facts it's only based on my gut feeling and my own intuition which sounds an awful lot like Rudy Giuliani saying well we don't have any evidence but we have theories well I think it's important to be analytically clear here and not to confuse two different issues one uh, is the question of voter suppression. That is laws that are passed to make it harder for people to register or to vote. And so Greg brought up the, the provision of the Georgia law that says you can't give people a glass of water. And um, it was kind of ironic about, I think maybe it was three weeks ago now, the Herschel Walker campaign uh, or a PAC, excuse me, a PAC supporting the Herschel Walker campaign was giving out gas cards, free gas cards, people get free gasoline. Uh, you know, vote for Herschel Walker, but you didn't have to do anything to get it. And, you know, I opined, I think Greg quoted me that it doesn't violate federal law, at least, to give people things as a giveaway um, for, um, as part of a campaign, as long as you don't do it to require people to vote or to vote in a particular way. But it is kind of ironic if, the, you know, the reason to not give water is because you're not allowed to treat voters, you're not allowed to bribe voters. You know, someone who's waiting online for two hours, you're bribing them with a glass of water, but it's okay to give, the, you know, out these $20 cards. Um, so I think there's a lot of um, question about whether these laws that are meant to promote voter integrity are actually doing that or meant to suppress the vote. There's also a separate question about whether they actually do suppress the vote, because one thing we should point out is that turnout in Georgia was up uh, in the primary. Uh, we'll see how things go in the general election. That's not true everywhere. If you look in Texas uh, during their primary, there were tens of thousands of voters who were not able to comply with a new law that makes it harder to successfully vote by mail. So that's one issue, and it's it's uh, it's a concern. And sometimes there's exaggeration about how bad these laws are and separating things out. But it's actually number two on my list. And what you talked about just at the end of your question is number one, and it's what Greg mentioned too about the county 
uh, boards potentially being taken over by the state. And that's the danger of election subversion. It's the idea that people are going to mess with the vote totals so that um, the loser is, is declared the winner or refuse to certify an election, as we saw in New Mexico. This is something new. We haven't seen this in the United States before, right? Uh, making it harder for people to vote, especially people of color. You said Jim Crow too, because there was a Jim Crow one, right? We know how that works. What's new is we're going to find a way to steal the election to have the loser declared the winner. We're going to come up with fake slates of electors. We're going to refuse to do our ministerial duty of certifying elections. This is a huge danger. And this is the number one topic that I plan on working on over the next five years is how do we assure that we can have a coalition of people, Democrats, Republicans, independents in the center who are committed to the rule of law and are committed to the idea that we should have free and fair elections and that the winner of the election should actually be able to take office. It's kind of a sad commentary that, that you know, we've gone this far back, but this is, I think, a the, an urgent danger facing American democracy right now. And how does one counter that when somebody stands up there and says, yes, I'll support whatever constitution, state or federal I'm I'm supposed to support and then do exactly the opposite? Well, so what happened in New Mexico, to take that example, was someone went to the New Mexico Supreme Court and the New Mexico Supreme Court issued an order, what's called a writ of mandamus, and said, you better do it. And what you read, that quote from that gentleman, uh, the, the, the same gentleman who I bl believe was in D.C. as he was being sentenced for his part in the January 6th insurrection, he was the dissenter because the other two didn't feel like going to jail for um, disobeying an order of the courts. So, you know, uh, there's lots I criticize about the U.S. Supreme Court, for example, and about courts generally in terms of how they view voting rights. But the courts held the line in 2020 when it came to trying to use the courts to manipulate the election results. And so I think a key part of what we need to look at is how do we strengthen the rule of law in courts so that courts can prevent some of this nonsense from going on in future elections? We can take your questions. If you'll put them in the Q&A box, we'll look for them. And there are a couple that I can put together for... Um... Uh, let me see for Greg here, they're, they're really kind of the same, different aspects of the same point. Sid wonders whether voter suppressions were successful in this week's Georgia election. And Jordan wonders whether the Georgia Secretary of State was gaslighting the public yesterday, talking about the two to three minute average to vote. And was that the same in black voting districts? Yeah, the second one first. Um, th th this is this is a typical approach from the Secretary of State and Republican election officials in general in Georgia. That's the same approach that Brian Kemp did when he was the Secretary of State. Is there's a lot of polling places. Um, there's a lot of rural polling places where there's not much of a wait, right? Where um, if you know, in my neighborhood, for instance, I'm not in rural Georgia. I'm in suburban Georgia. But it, it, even at the height of the long lines in Georgia in 2018 and 2020, I could go right in and vote. Um, but we're talking about mostly um, uh, more urban areas in Atlanta, more majority black areas in Atlanta where it was not that easy, where I witnessed people going to vote who literally brought lawn chairs and coolers because they knew it would take not just an hour, but hours, four, five, six hours when an armchair, when a, when a folding chair, when a cooler becomes an accessory to vote, there's a giant problem. Um, and, and back then, when I reported on all those issues, and my colleagues reported on those issues, that was the answer from Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, which is, well, the average is two, three minutes. Yes, but in very dense parts of, of, of Atlanta, the average was more like four or five hours. And, you know, I talked to many voters who could, who could afford to wait that long, who take, took off the day of work, who had help, who could. And there's many, many, many more voters who couldn't do that, who, who cannot take six hours of their day, four hours of their day, three hours of their day to go and try to cast their ballot. Um, fortunately in Georgia, we, we do have um, other means. Of course, there is no, no excuse absentee ballot. So you can, you can mail in vote. Um, and you can also, there's a, there's a three week early voting period um, for general elections and for primaries. It's shortened now for runoffs. The question, the other question was, have we seen um, any sort of diminished turnout because of this law um, from, from yesterday's vote? And yesterday was a runoff, so very light turnout. Um, very small weights, a few technical glitches. We don't have all the data yet back, but um, we didn't hear too many problems. Uh, the, the big test will be November, but in the primary, we have to remember the word absentee appeared 343 times in the voting bill that we talked about that, that was signed into law last year. The law was designed to crack down on mail-in balloting more than early voting. So yeah, we saw a, a record number of votes in a primary. 
Um, but the number of absentee voters, it plunged even as the overall uh, turnout reached a record high for midterm primary. And, and that was and that was what the law was really uh, designed to do. It was designed to, to, to siphon out and, and, and target absentee voting. And part of the reason is because there is a, a drop box limitations in those additional ID requirements we talked about earlier. So we, we did see a, a, a significant drop off in those, in those mail-in ballots. And again, we'll know in November um, really the extent of what this new law uh, does to the, elect, uh, the electorate here in Georgia. Rick, before we get to your solutions about misinformation and disinformation, I want to ask about, as and many people who are posting comments here are asking the same thing about how you get into a closed system that sets up the judiciary in its favor, that elects officials who are perfectly willing to ignore actual election results and give, uh, give their party, give their candidates the results they want. How do you enter into that? You talked about people going to the New Mexico Supreme Court, but it seems like if every entrance to a solution is blocked, what then? Well, first of all, there's still the chance to defeat people uh, at the ballot box. Uh, and so uh, I said early on, before I knew who any of the candidates were, that if a candidate takes the view that the 2020 election was stolen and that they would not have certified the election for the winner of the election, they should be politically opposed. And we've seen stories now of major fundraising uh, on the part of Democrats and others to try to defeat some of these candidates. Now, not everybody's doing that. Democrats in Pennsylvania actually boosted Doug Mastriano, the, the guy who said he wouldn't have certified for Biden, because I think he's going to be easier to beat. I mean, that's kind of like hoping for Trump to go against Clinton in 2016. Seems like not a wise strategy. Uh, so the first way to try to deal with this is political. But I don't think every avenue would be blocked, in, in, in part uh, because um, I do think that there is some separation between law and politics, even uh, when it comes to elected judiciaries. I think we saw judges, Republicans, Democrats, and others trying to do the right thing in 2020. Uh, very few judges gave uh, any serious uh, thought to siding with Trump or Giuliani when they didn't produce evidence, right? You mentioned uh, what Giuliani was quoted as saying at the uh, at the hearing yesterday, I don't have evidence, but I have theories. That doesn't fly in federal court. Uh, and there was a very impassioned um, uh, opinion from Judge Stefan Bibas, who's a federal society stalwart as a third circuit judge, who said, you know, this is not how the United States works. And so long as we can keep bucking up the judiciary, I think that remains one of the main uh, um stalwarts in terms of protecting our democracy. You think about all the institutions that Trump attacked uh, in, in his time in office, uh, the, the press, the FBI, the opposition party, the judiciary, right, his own party. These are all the institutions that help preserve the rule of law and democracy. And they're the institutions that have to be bucked up. So a big part of what I say in cheap speech is that because of the First Amendment and the difficulty, we can't just have a law that says, don't lie about the last election being stolen. You need to rely upon non-legal means, supporting civil society. You know, if that means a general strike and people coming out and protesting in Pennsylvania when the governor says, I won't certify the election and taking to the streets, it might require that, the kind of things that we see in other countries. We're not that far off from that where we might need to resort to people power to try to preserve our democracy. Greg, one thing that happened in the recent Florida elections is, is the Republicans were shooting themselves in the foot once in a while. You had Trump saying, don't vote in the Senate elections because they're crooked. Uh, you had uh, uh, Kelly Loeffler, who was going to the richest candidate in 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 Congress, you know, um, married to the I think the head of the New York Stock Exchange, and you had the kind of residual Roy Moore sensibility about who are some of these candidates who just keep circling around and around again. So I wonder if, if there's any sense in Georgia that the Trump grip on Trumpism is beginning to loosen? Are voters getting disenchanted? Are elected officials, more importantly, beginning to break away from this a little and maybe establish the kind of Republican Party that would distance itself and, and set itself apart from what Trump has been doing? So I'll say yes and no. Georgia might be the best example of Republicans showing their independence from Donald Trump because of the primary and because of last night's runoffs here. In the primary, Brian Kemp and, uh, uh, and, and four other Three, three other Republican incumbents all beat back Donald Trump challengers, Donald Trump back challengers. David Perdue, 
um, lost, Jody Heiss lost to Brad Raffensperger, and then two lower level candidates uh, lost an insurance commissioner and, um, and uh, why am I forgetting the other race? Um, it's been, a, there's a lot of races in Georgia right now, insurance commissioner and, uh, and labor commissioner. Um, but at the same, and not only did they lose, they were humiliated. I mean, uh, David Perdue lost by 52 points. It was not even close in the end. And then in last night's runoffs, two more Trump back uh, candidates for the US House seats were demolished by other Republicans who didn't have Donald Trump's endorsement. So I say it, it's a re, it was a rebuke, but the reason why I say yes and no is because every single Republican who won is also a supporter of Donald Trump. Um, even Brian Kemp, even Brad Raffensperger, who, who have been, I mean, Donald, Brian Kemp might be personal enemy number one, uh, the very top of Donald Trump's revenge list, even higher maybe than even than Liz, Liz Cheney. And Brian Kemp still, if I ask him, uh, who are you gonna vote for? Who would you vote for in, in 20, uh, 2024 if, if Donald Trump's on the ballot, he'll still say Donald Trump. Um, they still cling to his policies. They still embrace his, his stances. And you won't hear Brian Kemp say a single bad word about Donald Trump. So there is that sort of streak of independence of Georgia Republican voters who are veering away from Trump, who don't want interference with him in local races. But at the same time, um, he still gets you know 30%, 20 to 30% of the vote for anyone he endorses right off the bat, even in the case of a congressional candidate last night named Vernon Jones, who was a Democrat a year ago. <laughs> he literally switched parties a year ago um, and was not only a Democrat, but he was the head, he was the chief executive of Georgia's most important Democratic county, uh, DeKalb County. And he became a Trump acolyte and you know, got, earned Trump's endorsement. And he, that guy won 20 um, something percent of the vote off the bat in a rural Northeast district where he didn't even live. Let me get a quick answer from you, Greg, before I go back to Rick for some of his solutions. Rachel in Seminole, which I'm assuming is in Florida, wants to know whether the January 6th hearings are making any difference with swing voters, with independent voters, making any inroads into the kind of credulity and, and crosstalk insults that seem to have dominated politics elsewhere. What are, what are you seeing? You know, the Democratic candidates here are not leaning into them. Stacey Abrams, Senator Raphael Warnock, they're not leaning into these hearings. You know, they're, if you ask them, they'll say how shocking and galling and, and horrifying they were and, and what they exposed, but they're not messaging on them. They're not running ads on them. They're not making the center of their campaign um, appearances. Um, and, 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 you know, and that reflects a concern that is going to be a concern everywhere, which is the fact that the economy is going to be, it probably will be the main, the number one issue for voters. And so instead of talking about the January 6th hearing, um, Senator Warnock spent the day today talking about efforts to do a federal gas tax pause. Stacey Abrams is talking about giving raises to, to teachers and, um, and instituting a, a longer state gas tax holiday. So those are the issues that they're focusing on. Um, it, it, in a sense, it's somewhat like impeachment was in early 2020 when a lot of people thought that the race could, for president could hinge on, on, on a referendum on impeachment. And then by, by October, <laughs> it, was, it was very far from, from voters' minds. And right now, every strategist from every part, from either party here in Georgia, they think that if inflation, fuel prices, and the economy will be what d dictates the outcome of this election. Um, so, so Rick, what are the in terms of addressing the kind of disinformation and misinformation that's the subject of your book? What can current law do, and what are the limits of current law? So, I do think there are some laws that could be passed that could help. So, for example. I think we can have a law that makes it uh, a crime to lie about when, where, or how people vote. Uh, in 2016, for example, uh, we had a Trump supporter uh, send out messages targeted to the African-American uh, voting community saying that people can vote by text or social media hashtag. And about uh, four or 5,000 people tried to, to vote in this way. We don't know if they ended up trying to vote in another way as well. That person is now being prosecuted under a, um, a federal law that, that uh, may or may not apply to that kind of activity. But I do think that the Supreme Court has said that it's perfectly uh, okay to have laws that make it uh, illegal to mislead people about how they can vote. That only gets at a small part of the problem. That doesn't stop people from lying and saying the next election will be stolen or the last election was stolen. Uh, but it would send somewhat of a signal, and it would send a signal to social media companies that they uh, uh, need to police the most egregious uh, of these kinds of false statements, some of which they already do. 
so that kind of law, I think, would be uh, constitutional, but it would be kind of uh, small potatoes. Uh, we also could have improved disclosure laws. So one of the things that uh, we're seeing uh, today is that if you get a TV ad, uh, you're watching TV, and it's coming to you through your cable box or through your satellite, it's subject to certain disclosure rules. So you know who's speaking to you, and you know you might care if the person who's sending you the message is the NRA or Planned Parenthood, you know, or the Russian government. Like you might want to know who's behind the message, uh, and there are requirements of disclosure if that ad comes to you uh, on TV. But if you're getting your TV signal through uh, Hulu or YouTube TV, is coming to you through the internet, it's not subject to disclosure. That's just because our campaign finance laws have not been updated to the way that people communicate today. Uh, similarly. Uh, we're seeing uh, advances in artificial intelligence that make it easier to create fake videos that might make a politician look like she's having a heart attack or saying a racial epithet. These are so-called Nancy fakes. Nancy Pelosi video was tampered with. Right. So that one was they call that one a cheap fake because they use the old technology, but there are ways to make it look a lot better. And so another thing that I think would be constitutional would be a law that would require that when uh, these kind of videos appear on social media, they have to be labeled as altered. So that voters would know as they're looking at it, this is not the real thing. Joe Biden's not having a heart attack. Jo Donald Trump did not just say the N-word. Um, I think that kind of law would be constitutional. Part of the problem is that the Supreme Court, um, uh, its, it's jurisprudence makes it harder and harder to get these things through. And in fact, um, there's a law that... Um, Texas and Florida each pass laws that would essentially require the replatforming of Donald Trump. So even if a politician uh, undermines election integrity, even if they encourage violence, they might have to be replatformed. Uh, a, a federal district court in Texas had put it on hold as a violation of the First Amendment. And just a few weeks ago, you had three justices on the Supreme Court, Justices Alito, Gorsuch, and Thomas, who suggest, you know what, maybe we could regulate social media in this way. And it's really ironic because these are justices that generally don't believe, for example, that you can limit money in politics because that's free speech and it's protected by the First Amendment. Or and tell social media what to do. And, right. So I'm uh, the fact that there were only three votes for that is somewhat heartening. So I do hope that this kind of law will be struck down. Uh, there's it, defamation might help. So Greg mentioned the election workers uh, who um, have been subject to harassment. Well, they settled with OAN, but I think they still have lawsuits against Rudy Giuliani and against uh, some others. So defamation law can help. So there are some legal tools, but as I mentioned, I don't wanna take up all the time, but as I mentioned, in addition to legal change, I think we need political change. We need to enforce civil, reinforce civil society and those truth-telling mechanisms, for example, like subsidizing nonprofit journalism, which is so important, especially on the local level, to let people know what's true and what's false in a, in a way that is verifiable to voters. Let me bring in one more point with you, Rick, before I go back to, to Greg for a, a final wrap up. And that is that you thought that antitrust law might be more effective than First Amendment law in balancing this out and then cleaning out some of the disinformation. Well, so, you know, if you think about uh, Google, they also own YouTube and they control so much of the advertising revenue that used to go to local newspapers and local TV uh, is there. You think about Facebook owned by Meta also owns WhatsApp, also owns Instagram. It would not violate the First Amendment to say these companies have to be broken up uh, to make search more competitive, right? There really is no second competitor to Google when it comes to search. And so um, those kinds of solutions don't implicate the First Amendment. More competition could help. And it could also, you know, if all of the Trump supporters go to tr Truth Social, the new Trump support, they'll still believe the misinformation, but it has less chance of being contagion that spreads to other people. And so things like QAnon and other kinds of dangerous conspiracy theories, maybe they get cordoned off. Maybe that's not such a bad thing if there's more fragmentation of the market and not everybody's on the same platform. Uh, Greg, there's still more elections coming up in Georgia. You seem to have more elections than California. Our ballots are longer, but your elections are more frequent. So how do some of these changes and re-strategizing positioning look? Can you give us something optimistic to look forward to? Um, optimism. Um, you know, November's approaching and, um, you know, th these battles, these, these election contests between uh, Stacey Abrams and Governor Kemp and Herschel Walker, the former football star against Raphael Warnock, are going to be the most expensive midterm contests in, in the state's history. 
um, they're going to go well over the $150 million, probably closer to two of the $300 million, not the billion dollars that, that the runoffs cost, but approaching that number in a sense. Um, and look, Democrats know here that they have their work cut out for them. Um, but at the same time, um, you, you, Republicans, Democrats, whoever, no one here ever counts out Stacey Abrams. Um, her get out the vote strategy, her appeals to um, voters who usually don't vote in midterm elections in 2018 narrowly, uh, almost got her elected in 2020, um, ringing out every vote she possibly could, um, helped engineer, orchestrate, architect the, uh, the, the, the Democratic victories of President, of President Joe Biden in Georgia for the first time since 1992, and John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock's Senate sweep. And I talked, to, I'm writing how many stories? Four stories a day, it seems, on, on the elections. And uh, I talked to um, a supporter of Stacey Abrams just, just a few hours ago uh, about the bleak, it seems pretty bleak right now for, for her election chances. And she said, look, Stacey Abrams knows who every new left-leaning voter in Georgia is. She knows where they live and she knows who their mom is. <laughs> so <laughs> there is a, a very strategic get out the vote plan right now for the Democrats and Republicans know that this will not be a, a cakewalk by any sense for them well, to, uh, to retain power in Georgia. We may find ourselves changing the phrase instead of as Maine goes, so goes the nation, the nation as Georgia goes, so goes the nation. And Rick, let me go back to you for just a minute or so of something hopeful, maybe something a little optimistic about what you see perhaps emerging from the January 6th hearings or some of the consequences of maybe a recoil around the country, people saying, we don't wanna be that kind of nation. I do think that the January 6th hearings are energizing people and they are reminding people of something. You know, the Trump years were so exhausting for everyone. It was such a contentious period uh, that I think a lot of people blocked out what happened in the, at the end of the Trump presidency. And so hearing what's happened, um, having the picture being put forward in a coherent way uh, it's not in Democrats or Republicans' interest to be making this a campaign issue, as, as Greg noted. But I do think that uh, the public being aware and there are steps being taken to try to assure that we can support our government and institutions that protect free and fair elections. For those people who care about that issue, uh, I think it's good to know that they're not alone and that you know, th there are significant parts of the country that really want to act to preserve American democracy. Rick, do you think people watching the January 6th hearings have already pretty much made up their minds? I think a lot of people had forgotten some of the details. And, you know, if you look at some of the polling, sure, Democrats are uh, more uh, interested in what's happened than, uh, than Republicans and, and believe it more. But independents seem to be, and people are tuning in, the numbers are high. There's a reason, you know, just before we got on, the New York Times posted a story about Trump complaining that there were no Jim Jordans on the, on the panel. You know, Kevin McCarthy kind of boycotted the panel, I think probably at Trump's insistence, but I think they realized they made a blunder because the story is being told in a coherent way and you don't have the Jim Jordan's running interference. I think they've run a very effective hearing for those who are tuning in and have a, an open mind. And Donald Trump is insightful enough to know what constitutes good television. That, that is certainly true. All right. Well, I want to thank you both very much. Rick Hassan, the go-to election expert these days, at the University of California, Irvine, soon to be at UCLA. His latest book is Cheap Speech, How Disinformation Poisons Our Politics and How to Cure It. And Greg Bluestein joins us here for the first time, the senior political reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, contributor to Political Insider. His book is Flipped, How Georgia Turned Purple and Broke the Monopoly on Republican Power. Gentlemen, thank you both so very much. Thank you. Now, Thank you. Next week, you need to be back with us on June 29th at 5 p.m. Pacific. Madeline Brand is talking to Peter Baker of the New York Times and Susan Glasser of the, uh, the New Yorker. They have both covered Russia and are going to be here talking about Russia's war on Ukraine, some of the consequences which are piling up day after day, the consequences to the world economy, the consequences to freedom and democracy in that part of the world. And as a consequence of that, to the rest of us. So please join us next Wednesday, the 29th at 5 p.m. Pacific. Thanks to JUDJ for organizing this and thank you, thank you all for joining us this evening.